So let's begin. Before we start with the substance of our agenda, uh, I want to uh, explain to you a change of plans. So we had intended to have today a guest because the idea is to have in each of our classes, up to the next to the last class, an interlocutor. And uh, this guest uh, withdrew uh, at the last moment and will therefore not be here. Uh, the guest uh, is a uh, well-known and influential right-wing activist. Uh, it is our belief that uh, it's very important that we have in this space and in all spaces like it uh, a dialogue a contrast of views. And we want to insist that our conversation not be just among like-minded people. But uh, these invitations are conditional. And they are conditional on the willingness of the guest to sit down and engage in sustained discussion. No one can come here into this space and give a speech. And that condition turned out to be unacceptable. Uh, would you like to say something, Cornell? <laughs> well, yes, indeed. I mean, we're, uh, no, I mean, I think, we, you know, we're disappointed because we believe in robust, uninhibited dialogue in public space across ideological and political lines. I think it's very important at this moment of balkanization and polarization that we, we, we raise voices, we contest voices, we engage in very, very serious and substantive conversation. I mean, I've, just last week I was involved at the Kennedy School with my dear brother, Robbie George, who was an influential right-wing brother. I've taught with him for 12 years in classes. We travel around the country just to try to exemplify what it is to try to engage in not just respectful conversation, because he and I have deep love and respect for each other, but very contentious conversation because the subject matter is so much bigger than us and no one ideological perspective has a monopoly on truth, capital T. Uh, but at the same time, it can't be a, a situation which people do come in and simply want to present their views uh, in, in, in a speech rather than the kind of Socratic exchange that is so very, very crucial. So that in a certain sense, we apologize at telling you all that we're going to have a speaker uh, each week and then the night before. Not a speaker, but an interlocutor. Right? Oh, yeah, I mean interlocutor, yeah. a figure who yes. speaks in a dialogical mode. They don't speak, speak to us, they speak with us. And they speak with us and speak to the subject matter and they speak with each and every one of, yeah. of you all as, as well. And so we'll, we will have uh, figures coming yes. in to engage in that yes. kind of dialogue. So, yeah, so next week, uh, we have as our guest uh, Julius Krein, who is the founder and editor of the journal American Affairs, which is now publishing some of the most interesting texts about the United States. We've just distributed uh, a, a light example uh, of his writing, but very uh, interesting, which was a review of certain books about American politics, a review published not in American Affairs, but in the Times Literary Supplement. And we are placing on the website uh, an article of his that was published in American Affairs called The Three Fusions, which we would like you to read before next week's class. Now let me tell you about our plan for today. Uh, we're not proceeding in a linear fashion. Uh, our project here is to imagine the alternative futures of American democracy in the light of an interpretation of the American experience. And to implement that project, we keep returning over and over again to the same themes, trying each time to add greater depth. Uh, 
and varying the method by which we proceed. So today we plan a discussion uh, that in its conceptual order would move in three steps. The first step is to return to the interpretation of the message of the American prophets uh, and develop our earlier conversation about that message and how we would have to revise the message as well as understand it. Uh, the second step has to do with the programmatic substance of the general alternative that we have begun to explore here. The democratization of the market economy, the relation between advanced and backward parts of the production system, the relation of finance to the real economy, and the relation of capital to labor. And then the second element in that substantive uh, exploration is the transformation and the democratization of educational opportunity in the country. The change in the character of education that such an alternative demands. And the third element is the energizing of democratic politics, including the reinvention of American federalism as a setting for American experimentalism. And then the third step of the discussion, uh, after the engagement with the message of the prophets and the substantive programmatic project, is to deal with the obstacles. And in particular, the obstacles to the formation of a transracial progressive majority in the country. We have discussed here already briefly two of those obstacles. Uh, the contentious relation between race and class uh, and the conflict of moral agendas in the United States. But we want to add a third obstacle, which is the confusion caused by the debate about nationalism. Uh, now, this is the logical order, but we want to depart from the logical order for the sake of emphasizing here in this class what is new in our discussion. So we're going to put this third step before the second step. After discussing the message of the prophets, we're going to go directly to the obstacles and uh, explore uh, nationalism and race and class. And then according to the time available, we'll return to the second step, to the substance of the alternative that we have begun to discuss. That's the plan. Now, uh, now I begin with the message of the prophets. And as before, we're going to proceed in this way. I'm going to begin with a few propositions. Uh, Cornell is going to engage to respond. And then we're going to open it up to conversation with you. The essential message of the American prophets is the message of the greatness, even of the divinity, of the ordinary man and woman. And uh, the hope sustained by this insight of the ascent of common humanity to a higher level of life with greater capacity, uh, larger intensity, broader scope. It is an idea, according to this interpretation, of deep freedom. The focus is freedom, not equality on this interpretation, mm. as Tocqueville suggested in his work on the Americans. Uh, it is incompatible with entrenched inequality, but its, its essence has to do with this larger freedom, with this idea that we become more human by becoming more godlike, not just an elite, 
but everyone, every man, in common experience. Now, that's the idea that I want briefly to deepen. And I propose to deepen it by suggesting two sets of contradictory conditions for our self-affirmation, for the way in which we come more fully into the possession of life and become greater, but greater together rather than apart. The first set of conditions has to do with the relation between the self and other people. And there is the following contradiction. To live, to affirm ourselves, we have to connect. Everything in our experience depends on connection. No one becomes bigger alone. But every connection is at the same time a threat. Every connection threatens us with the loss of distinction and of freedom. How is it that we can connect without paying for the connection this price of subjugation or loss of self? That's the question. And to be free, we must solve this problem. Now, on this view, we can solve it in the sphere of intimacy through love. Because love is this mutual acceptance and recognition that allows us to connect without being subjugated or losing ourselves. But love cannot flourish beyond the sphere of intimacy. And therefore, we need a counterpart to love in ordinary social life. The counterpart to love is cooperation among free and equal agents. Uh, and thus comes the idea of an ascent to higher and higher forms of cooperation. Now, what is the general direction, the general character of this ascent? Uh, our ways of cooperating with one another must not be constrained or determined by some pre-established script of social division and hierarchy. Our hands must be untied. The institutional forms of cooperation must not be predetermined. We must be able to reinvent them as we go along. For example, if the market economy can be understood as a simplified form of cooperation among strangers that is impossible when there is no trust and unnecessary when there is high trust, the market economy must not be pinned down to a single dogmatic version of itself. The individual must be secure in a haven of vital safeguards and capability-sustaining endowments. But all of society must be thrown open to conflict, to innovation, to plasticity made possible by this security in the haven. Uh, no one should be required to do the kind of work that a machine could do. The machine should do for us what we have learned how to repeat, so that our supreme resource, our time, can be reserved for the not yet repeatable. And our work, our labor, under the regime of cooperation should be free, really free. Economically dependent wage labor is a deficient and transitory form of free labor and should give way over time to the higher forms of free labor, self-employment and cooperation. But for self-employment and cooperation to be compatible 
with the necessary aggregation of resources at scale, we must be able to innovate even radically in the regimes of property and of contract and so forth. So this is just the description of, a, of an ideal for the future. And the ideal is important even now in the immediate present because it begins to mark a direction. And thus, outside the sphere of intimacy, we begin to resolve this contradiction in the relationship between self and others, which is one of the essential conditions of our freedom, of becoming bigger together. Now there is a second contradictory condition of our greatness, of our, uh, of our rise to this more godlike status, godlike by virtue of the attribute of transcendence, not by virtue of the attributes of omniscience and omnipotence. And the second condition is this, that to be free, everyone must be able to engage in a real world, a real society and its order. If we cannot engage, if we are marginalized or isolated, we are not free. But every engagement brings with it the threat of surrender, that in engaging in a real world, we surrender to it and allow it to have the last word, rather than keeping the last word to ourselves. So to be really free, to possess deep freedom, we must be able to engage without surrendering. And to somehow be insiders and outsiders at the same time. Therefore, all of the arrangements of society must, over time, come to be designed so that these structures of social life are open-ended and invite their own revision and allow us to engage in them without surrendering to them. Now, these two sets of contradictory conditions having to do with the relation of the self to other people and the relation of the self to the real social world, the structure, uh, uh, represent the twin practical imperatives, the overriding practical imperatives of the advanced societies today. The imperatives of cooperation and of innovation. The most successful society is the one in which people can best cooperate and innovate. And there is a tension between the imperatives of cooperation and innovation. Every innovation requires cooperation to be designed and to be implemented. But at the same time, every innovation threatens the established cooperative regime because it introduces conflict and uncertainty about the positions of different individuals and groups resulting from the innovation. And in this respect, the most desirable cooperative regime is the one that moderates this tension and is most hospitable to perpetual innovation. Uh, now, in principle, uh, we could say that there is no country in the world that enjoys to a greater extent the strength in these faculties of cooperation and of innovation. Whatever the flaws of the United States, of its regime, for sure, uh, the Americans have excelled comparatively, in both the ability to cooperate and in the ability to innovate. But the exercise of these faculties, intimately related to the conditions of achieving more of deep freedom, 
come under constraint. And in our earlier discussion of the message of the American prophets, we discussed two fundamental constraints, two taints on the prophetic message. The first is a disturbance in the imagination of the relationship between self-construction and solidarity. The idea of the relation between self and others that I describe suggests that there is no self-construction without solidarity. That it's not just that the individual builds himself and crowns himself like a little Napoleon. And then on the basis of this magnificent strength is able to be generous. But the building already depends on connection. That's the importance of the higher regimes of cooperation. The second taint is the taint of institutional idolatry, the false and dangerous idea that the country early discovered the definitive formula of a free society, which has only to be revised from time to time under the pressure of crisis. The achievement of deep freedom requires permanent innovation in the institutional forms of a decentralized economy, an independent civil society, and a democratic politics. And to there, therefore, to progress in this direction, the Americans must trade in some bad American exceptionalism for some good American experimentalism. I really like that last line, though. Exceptionalism versus experimentalism. I'm going to get back to that. Let me begin by looking at the notion of deep freedom and the underside of the deep freedom. You know, there's a wonderful line in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov where Father Osima says, love in action is more harsh and dreadful than love in dreams. And I want to say the same thing about freedom. That nearly every conception of freedom we know is usually predicated on somebody else's unfreedom. The freedom to dominate. Thomas Jefferson calls in America the empire of liberty, profoundly paradoxical. How are you going to have an empire of liberty? Whose liberty are you talking about? Whose liberty do you plan to take away in order for you to have it in the form of the land? Founding of an empire. Every empire has a myth of origins that's tied to freedom. But it downplays, it hides and conceals the domination. So that the paradoxical character of it, the Janus face character of it, is what we also want to stay in contact with, and hence even the great American prophets. Emerson, Whitman, Dewey, and others on the one hand, but then there's Melville, Henry Adams, Rook Kaiser, Tony Morrison, Faulkner. That's the underside. See. Here are the preconditions of your talk about freedom. And those preconditions include precious human beings who are dominated in order for you to be free. Patriarchal America, the freedom of men to subordinate women, stay in the private domestic household. Don't go to, edu to higher education. Certain jobs you never have access to. Long process of struggle, social movements, to bring some critique to bear. Civil War was very much about what? Confederacy was very explicit. We are fighting in the name of American freedom. The Confederacy, they were absolutely right. They were being true to the founding of America. 
because they said American freedom from the very beginning has been predicated on the enslavement of these black people. How come y'all changing your mind? Why do you want to be inconsistent? We're simply being true to where we started. And what did the North say? We're not fighting this war to free these black folk. We're fighting this war to preserve the Union. And it's not until you 180,000 black soldiers joined the Union Army with the army about to lose, 145,000 of those 180 themselves enslaved black people joining that army to break the back of the Confederacy Army. So lo and behold, abolition now becomes a constitutive element. And that's only true for the last two and a half years of the war. So that when we talk about freedom, I would say the same thing about working people. But the freedom of American corporations to dominate, exploit workers. 14th Amendment deployed over and over and over again in the courts, supported by many professors here at Harvard from the Harvard Law School, year in and year out, generation in and generation out. You see, that's what freedom is, the freedom of corporations to do what they want vis-a-vis -vis other human beings who will be treated the way those corporations want to treat them. And the government trying to intervene, that's socialism, that's communism. Let the market be free. Every time I hear the notion of a free market, I grab something in my pocket. <laughs> I say, oh, I know the history of this discourse about freedom. And yet, what's the response of Frederick Douglass of Sojourn the Truth? What is the response of Elizabeth Cady? What is the response of the Anna Julia Coopers? What are the response of the trade union? We want freedom too. But it's a freedom that's more broader, more inclusive. What's the response of socialists vis-a-vis -vis corporations unregulated. We want freedom for workers. What's the response of anti-imperialists, of anti-militarists? We want freedom for the wretched of the earth in the language of Franz Fanon. So in, in talking about American democracy and the ways in which the American prophets are calling for freedom, we always want to contextualize it, historicize it, Keep track of what it looks like in action, what it looks like on the ground. And that requires a very, very subtle, nuanced, complex reading of both the best as well as the worst. So that, for example, to come back to that last line about exceptionalism on the one hand and experimentalism on the other. You see, Experimental, experimentalism at least unleashes our Socratic energies to examine what kind of blindnesses and dogmas are circumscribing our conceptions of freedom. Crucial. But it has to be an experimentalism all the way down. America has, has, has had a magnificent history of ingenuity of being highly experimental about certain things, but hardly experimental about other things. You think 120 years ago, the top 1% of the population owned 49% of the wealth. Today, the top 1% of the population owned 43% of the wealth. Not a whole lot of effects of experimentalism in terms of wealth distribution. You've got much, much more wealth, absolutely. But in terms of that grotesque level of inequality, my God. You see, the same would be true in terms of white supremacy. You see, persisting, coming back in new forms, coming back in different iterations and elaborations over and over and over again. And we say to ourselves, oh my God, we just get so weary about it. We thought we had a breakthrough and here is a setback and so forth. Well, if we had a larger framework to understand it, maybe we'd have different kinds of expectations. If we had alternative analysis and visions, maybe we would not have thought that some incremental moves that would include 
black middle class folk and black professionals constitute some major substantive progress in terms of fighting against white supremacy when the white poor and the white, uh, black poor and the black working class thoroughly devastated, tied to incarceration. I know we're having the event tomorrow in terms of Harvard's investment in, in, in prisons and so forth, very important. Part of the attempt to keep track of the ways in which unfreedom can expand at the same time freedom for others can expand. And it's very uncomfortable to have to come to terms with that when we ourselves are often the beneficiaries of the freedom of expansion, and yet others are caught even more viciously in the mechanisms of unfreedom. And they're happening simultaneously at the same time. How do we re retain in our minds these simultaneous realities going on? The unprecedented possibilities for the professional classes and at the same time, massive social misery for working people, two jobs and still living in poverty, of all colors, of poverty rates increasing, especially among the most vulnerable children. 50% of children under six are black and brown living in poverty today. How could that be with all of this talk about opportunity and prosperity? For who? That's what Melville was talking about in Moby Dick. That's what Tony Mars is talking about in Beloved. There's a the short story I would highly recommend to you all, written by the second finest comic writer in the history of the American empire. The finest comic writer, of course, is Mark Twain. And I'm sure you've all read a lot of Mark Twain, especially the later Twain, and his critiques of the US empire and calling his age the Gilded Age. We live in the second Gilded Age. The text I have in mind is Miss Lonely Hearts by Nathaniel West. Miss Lonely Hearts. It's only about 56 pages. And it builds on the, the section that you all read in the Tocqueville's text, Why Americans Are So Restless in the Midst of Prosperity. It's a meditation that the Tocqueville has, of course, you all remember, on what is it? American loneliness. He calls it American spiritual decrepitude, the inability to make the connection between self and solidarity, between self and community, the atomism, the rapacious individualism, and in the end, the levels of psychic depression, joylessness in the midst of insatiable pleasure. The Tocqueville already saw it. Now, for in the case of Nathaniel West, he goes back to Dostoevsky. You all recall I invoked Dostoevsky, I think, earlier in the class. We started with Plato's Critique of Democracy, you remember. And of course, what I saw yesterday a little bit on television is hard to overlook. It was just Plato's script. Show me a democracy, and I'll show you a democracy that is in decline and decay and on the way to being run by petty gangsters. That's Plato in the Republic. On the way to tyranny. Why? Because the citizens don't have what it takes to create accountability. They're either too ignorant, they're too xenophobic, they're too greedy, they're too narrow. No democracy can survive. That's where I'm in solidarity with even the founding fathers, even the slaveholding founding fathers. That I, like Brother Roberto, do have a certain kind of democratic faith in the capacity of ordinary people to govern themselves with the right kinds of exposure to Socratic energy. You call it education, but even education is a little bit too narrow, you see, much too narrow, you see, the Socratic energy. But last point. What Nathaniel West does, he says, I want to rewrite Dostoevsky's critique of democracy by means of a comic strip. That's what the short story is. And the argument is, is that even all of the prophetic visions of democratic possibilities rest upon a notion of democratic soul craft, democratic capacities of people. And he opts for the much grimmer alternative. And it's always important 
if you're going to be someone holding on the democratic faith, to read the most powerful critics of that democratic faith. And he does as a leftist. He's an anarchist. He's a good friend of Eugene O'Neill, another part of the same tradition. We've talked about Iceman cometh over and over again in this class, which where greed tends to displace liberty and freedoms. But, but so that the challenge becomes, how do we provide counter examples in our lives, in our movements, in our networks, in our churches and mosques and synagogues and temples and trade unions and music connections, music organizations and so forth, in our teaching as democratic exemplars that keeps alive a tradition that is so very, very fragile and usually weak as it is today. And that's, in fact, where Nathaniel West ends in that, in that text, you see. Shall we open it up? Questions, queries? We want to make sure all voices are heard, though. So especially people who did not speak yeah, last for week. People, for people who haven't had a chance to raise their voices. No. But is it, we start here and then here. Yes, go right ahead. Loud so people behind you can hear. So it seems that as in physics, um, bodies, even inanimate ob objects, prefer inaction as opposed to action. They require some sort of action in order to react. It seems that then Aristotle, about people, spoke of the importance of habit, which forms nature along with reason. So it seems to me that as in physics and in human society, in order to have a kind of, a, in order to experiment or in order to have a change, mm -hmm. we need some sort of grip. We, we need some sort of graph or like a, a big sort of action that would um, make things kind of change or would <coughs> trigger the necessity of change in people's hearts or in people's minds. Um, so I guess how the question would be, how can we overcome this natural capacity of, it, of objects in nature and also of people to um, recreate their lives, to recreate their environments independently of the existence of action? So I guess, would it be reason? Purely reason? This reason is, is powerful enough, it's important enough, given the fact that in modern philosophy, more and modern philosophy or psychology, psychoanalysis itself, have not focused on reason at all. They prefer instinct. So I guess, to my mind, instinct prefers inaction. What about reason? Mm -hmm. Do you want to say a word about that? I mean, there's a lot there, though. I mean, I think Freudians would argue that it's really about logos. It really is about rational control of id in that way. It's just that id also is very weak in the world of instinct. But no, I think that the um, the, the, the fundamental answer I would give to you for this very important question is, how do we create democratic habits? This is John Dewey's project, Democracy and Education, 1916, or The Public and Its Problems in 1927. But what does it mean to engage in democratic habits? Well, one is you have to have Socratic habits. People need to be habituated in raising their voices so that other arguments, other perspectives are rendered accountable and answerable. These so Socratic habits have to do with questioning. They have to do with criticizing, beginning with oneself. Same is true with our institutions. Same would be true with, with, with other circulation of images and so forth and so forth. So there's got to be some connection between Socratic habits and democratic habits. But we know that human beings also are non-rational. And some of us believe that human beings are wretched. I do, because <laughs> I know things about myself. <laughs> but not solely wretched. We're wretched and wonderful simultaneously. You see, have the capacity to come to terms with one's wretchedness, to reflect on one's wretchedness. 
and that wretchedness, and I'm using the category that comes right out of the great David Walker and his appeal to colored citizens of the world of 1829. That's the category, the wretchedness of our condition. You see. And that's a way in that provides some way of connecting with the reality, not denying it, but still generating democratic habits. He was a radical Democrat. He was an abolitionist to the core. Only lived six months after he wrote that appeal. We know that. Died right here in the hotel in, in Boston. So that, that democratic habits is one way of trying to come to terms with the fact that we are very much creatures of, of, of habits and we need disruption, we need transgression, we need revolutions, we need ways of shaking various kinds of habits, especially when they're habits of domination. But I interpret your, your, your question mm -hmm. as being a question about, about the capacity for agency, for, for action, and what is it that triggers action in the ordinary person. So mm. what I mm. described as the imperative of innovation can be re-described as the imperative of the enhancement of agency. That's, that's mm -hmm. one of the two sides of, of deep freedom, that mm -hmm. we create the form of education, the practices and the institutions that invite perpetually the exercise of agency the action by the ordinary individual. And uh, the more you act, the more you learn how to act, and the more you were seduced by the experience of action. So that's what we want. And uh, those are the twin ideals that preside over this deepening of freedom, the development of the forms of cooperation, in the direction that I, that I outlined, and the enhancement of agency, so that the individual ceases to be passive. And every institutional proposal should be judged by that metric, whether it is conducive to the enhancement of agency or not. I saw yes. a hand in the back Yes, there. yes brother. Can you speak a little louder, please? Two wonderful questions. Do you want to take one of them? Or I'll take one, but which so one you want? <laughs> <laughs> They're all connected. They are connected. You know, uh, uh, I, in a sense, they seem to me to be false oppositions because mm. there's always a dialectic between political virtue and political institutions. Uh, institutions exist to economize on virtue. So virtue is a scarce resource. Absolutely. And we have Absolutely. institutions because virtue is not abundant. And the more flawed the institutions, the greater the need for compensatory virtue. But any movement that fails to have an institutional legacy is inherently precarious. Because the rest in politics are the waves of enthusiasm that come and go. And the allocation of resources to one group or to another. What remains is the institutional legacy. And so it's, it's crucial to use the moment of effervescence, of mobilization, 
to imagine the institutional progression, because that's what will remain. The institutions are always imperfect, like said the Constitution. So the Constitution is a point of departure in the realm of political institutions. What's wrong is then to adopt the cult of the Constitution, the, the, the reverential uh, a piety toward the established arrangements. Uh, they exist to be transformed. So what do the Americans have as their political institutions? This proto-democratic liberalism uh, with, with many anti-democratic elements justified in the name of political freedom. Low temperature politics, deliberate slowing down of politics, straight jacket on the potential of federalism, all justified in the name of political freedom. But it's not necessary. It's possible to maintain the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, but to repudiate the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. It's not necessary to choose between a politics that is cold and institutional, based on a low level of political mobilization, and a politics that is hot, but anti or extra institutional, because it depends on Caesarism, on strong men who act outside the institutions. What do we want? We want a politics that is hot and institutional at the same time. So these false oppositions have to be confronted by successive acts of institutional invention. And what is poisonous is to suppose that the institutional framework is a once and for all achievement in the life of the republic, rather than a, a, a permanent task. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I mean, quickly, both questions, though, it would take a good while. You know, when Hegel says the Isle of Minerva spreads its wings upon the falling of the dust, which is to say Minerva signifies wisdom and retrospective perspective, to look back and think what things would have been like is, of course, it's a hypothetical counterfactual. So you can only situate yourself in that context or situate yourself in present context and then see what kind of voice you would raise. So that should the Constitution have gone through? Well, you know, if one were there, like Thomas Paine with the abolitionists, they lost in the 1960s. Some of us fought, were fighting for abolition of poverty, full employment across the board with living wages rather than welfare programs. We lost the welfare programs and then affirmative action meant some progress but the class issue was pushed aside and poor folk left hanging. That's exactly what we're dealing with right now. We lost, right? And I won't even talk about the eight years of Obama. That's a whole different thing. But I lost, but I mean, that's not the point. <laughs> In terms of accountability of Wall Street, accountability of foreign policy and so forth and so on. You see? So that you can only look back and say, based on one's own analysis in light of the lens through which you look at the world, that's for where one would have been. Say, let's jump to, to, to your, your present question. Right now, it's true that we want strong institutions, but most importantly, we, all we need are some courageous persons, courageous citizens, especially influential ones in the Republican Party that can move and Trump would be gone like this. Quick, you saw that yesterday too. Where was the Socratic energy on the right wing side when you're talking about gangster activity? You've been talking about a Republican Party tied to morality and Christian evangelical sensibilities for the last 40 years. All of a sudden, empty. We're not concerned about morality. We're not concerned about integrity. You see what I mean? It just drops quick, overnight, you see. So that, and of course, and all the Democrats need to do is just send a note to the Treasury Department and say, we're going to get your taxes whether you want to or not. We have access to the taxes of every citizen, including a president. They don't have the courage to do that. How come? Well, interesting. Maybe they're not as radically different as we think, because they got something to hide.
they got something to conceal in their relation to the ruling classes. See what I mean? So if we're going to be Socratic, we got to be Socratic all the way down. You got to be willing to question all the way down. You got to be willing to pull the veil all the way down. And lo and behold, we discover, my God, both of these parties more and more look like they're emperors with no clothes. And Trump knows that. He's got that on them. He's an honest gangster. <laughs> he is. He, he, he started the whole program. He started the whole, his whole uh, campaign like that. He knows stuff about every major figure in both parties because he's been part of the party, P, party capital P. The ruling class party, the elite party. Just like Unger and I, as part of elite professors at Harvard, we know a lot of stuff. <laughs> we won't go into that right now. Because you're on the inside. You know folk. You know connections. You know patronage. You know nepotism. You all have the same experience here at Harvard, too. So that the question becomes, well, what does democratic accountability look like? I'm not talking about just squealing on folk. But democratic accountability, especially when maybe the, the future of the republic is at stake, which I think in part it is. And it might be all, all, almost already over anyway. We're just dealing with the, the relics in that sense. But that second question is an important one. So it's not just institutions. You need courageous individuals. Look at Cohen himself. He was duped. And what did he say yesterday? He said, anybody who did what I did will be in my position on the way to prison. That's just what he said. And he was honest about that. And the love of his family was genuine. There's no, I, I thought it was very genuine. I didn't see the whole thing. I just saw highlights. I can't take too much of it. <laughs> I'm just getting older, I don't want a heart attack. And you know, black men only take so many lives in America, given all this mess we got to deal with on other. But uh, we got to wait. Should we go on? Should we go on? Or should we have one other question? Just one more. One more. Now, that's a strong word, but is, is it really freedom or is it bliss? Another one that, another question I have regarding freedom, it seems to me also that it can be independent of one's situation. I'm thinking about Paul as he wrote letters as he was incarcerated, and his, his letters show so much sense of freedom and joy. So even if somebody's physically not free, could there or their mind be free outside of oh, the prison. So um, just kind of those two things just came to my mind. Those are very separate questions. So let, let, me, let me just take the first one. Um, insight into the, into the real is inseparable from insight into the possibility of transformation. To understand a phenomenon is to understand what it can become. But that's not the same thing as believing, as you say, the child does. But the, the cognitive psychologist would disagree with you, that everything is possible. Because that's not insight. That's just, as you said, ignorance, misunderstanding. Uh, to, to, to understand something is to understand its possibilities of transformation in the domain of the adjacent possible. What can happen next? That's one of the problems that we have here in an exercise like this one. Uh, the established social sciences and the policy discourse have each in its own way severed the vital connection between insight into the existent and imagination of the adjacent possible. And what they, on the whole, produce 
is a retrospective rationalization of the existent. They have no transformative insight. So it's like staring at something rather than seeing it and understanding it. Mm -hmm. uh, but this idea that of, of everything being possible is then a betrayal of this task of deepening your insight into the actual. The Kant uh, says somewhere in the Critique of Pure Reason that the dove flying in the air imagines that it could fly even faster if there were no air, because then there'd be no attrition. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that kind of an illusion. The resistance of reality is the condition of transformation and the condition of insight. And we have here, in an exercise like this one, this problem. To develop this programmatic discourse, we need an economics, but not the economics that exists. Another economics that doesn't exist. We need a political science, but not this one that's taught here, another one and so forth. And so the programmatic ambition then becomes an instigation to intellectual revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just very briefly, I think it is very important to draw a distinction between the childish and the childlike. And one of the benchmarks of maturity is to preserve childlike qualities like awe, wonder, surprise, openness, childish, Narcissistic, narrow, navel gazing. That's what needs to die. It never does, but that's what needs to be fought. So part of it, how do you preserve the childlike qualities in one's maturation? This is part of the great insights of the legacy of Jerusalem too. Except you be a child, there's no way you will understand what the struggle for love and justice is. That comes right out of prophetic Judaism with Jesus. What does that mean, except you be a child? Except you have not a selfish modesty, but a self-surrendering humility. And children are not jaded. They're not socialized to be obsessed with who's the smartest quickly. It happens very quick, you see, because they've got their own narcissistic elements too. You see. But they have a, a certain kind of a What's the right word? I mean, authenticity might be too strong, but it's something like that. You see, or put it another way, to use Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The children have not learned how to wear the mask. But to be socialized is to know how to wear it, when to wear it, what to hide, what to conceal, what to project, what image will lead towards success, acceptance, approval. That's part of what it is to become an adult in any society. But it means downplaying that childlike quality. Now, let's go. You know, we'll go to the second. Uh, now, so, so what we're going to do now, according to the revised plan I suggested, is to, for the moment to pass over the programmatic discussion to which we'll return and go immediately to the obstacles. Yeah, yeah. And in particular, the obstacles to the formation in the country of a transracial progressive majority. Uh, the obstacle on, on which I propose to focus first is the one that we have not yet discussed at all, which is the confusion introduced by the appeal to nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, in the rich North Atlantic world now, nationalism is mainly associated with the right. But in the rest of the world, and for much of modern history, nationalism has been associated with the left. Uh, and it seems important to have a position about nationalism and to understand the relation of the nationalist impulse to a progressive alternative. Now, what then is the national idea? How should we understand it, and how should we develop it? 
Imagine a spectrum. At one pole of this spectrum is the idea of the nation as an expression of homogeneity, ethnic, mm. racial, cultural, religious, sameness. The nation as a tribe, as a family of families, based on a quasi-biological principle of common descent, reinforced then by similarity of experience and outlook. And to this day, there are many European peoples that remain relatively close to this idea of the nation. But the United States has never been a nation in this sense. The last time that the United States was in any way a nation like, like this was in the 16th century. The pretense that the United States is now or can become a nation in that sense is a fiction. And it seems to be in the concrete conditions of contemporary American culture and politics, uh, mainly a fiction for an idea of white supremacy. It's a disguised form of the idea of white supremacy. But white supremacy is itself a fiction. It's a second order fiction because it is invoked in the defense, uh, not of the interests of the white working class majority, but of some much narrower set of interests, and typically of the interest of money elites. So there's this kind of double fiction. Now, what happens when we proceed along this spectrum in the opposite direction? We come to another idea of the nation. The nation is an experiment in humanity, a distinct way of being human. What is the deep basis of the division of humanity into separate states and nations. The deep basis is that humanity can develop its powers and potential only by developing them in different directions. There is no natural form of society. So the idea that is central to classical liberal political theory that there is an impersonal or neutral framework of institutions and of laws, neutral with respect to conflicting visions of the human good, is an illusion. No institutional framework can be neutral. Every institutional framework tilts the scales in favor of certain forms of human experience and against others. The ideal of neutrality is dangerous because every time it is invoked, it is invoked in practice in favor of its opposite. It becomes an instrument for the entrenchment of a sectarian view of humanity. Nevertheless, there is a kinship between the illusory and dangerous ideal of neutrality and another ideal which is realistic valuable and even indispensable. The other ideal is that we should want there to be forms of social life that are distinct, but each of those distinct forms is open to a wide range of experience. Each is full of internal contradictions. And above all, each is organized to render itself corrigible in the light of experience. So this ideal of catholicity and corrigibility is the valuable equivalent to the false ideal of neutrality. But what it means is that there must be these different forms of social life. They must develop in different directions. And they must take 
distinct institutional forms. That's the alternative idea of the nation. The nation then becomes a community of fate, a project, a project in the development of this distinct way of being human. And the project has to be sustained over time by the strengthening of the forms of collective action. How is this community of faith built? It is built by people doing many things together. That's how they build it. Uh, now, in this passage from the tribal idea to the, of the nation, to the idea of the nation as a distinct way of being human, there is a surprise. There is a surprising obstacle that we discover along the way and that we do not yet understand. The surprising obstacle is the uniquely poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. Let me explain. Uh, for the ancient Romans, for example, to be a Roman was to live according to the customs of the Romans. The collective identity had a tangible customary content. But that is not the character of contemporary nationalism. The real situation is that in the world today, in the age of world history, the elites that govern states roam the whole world to discover what works. And they import, they imitate the arrangements of foreign societies. And they come to the altar of this worldwide practical and ideological emulation and competition. And they tear out parts of themselves. They sacrifice parts of their received collective identity and combine what remains with the parts that they import or imitate. There is a cumulative evisceration, a hollowing out of the concrete collective identities. Uh, but the will to be different rather than being quieted, is inflamed. Paradoxically, the will to be different is aroused even as the actual differences wane. So two peoples who live side by side hate each other, not because they are different, but because they are becoming alike. And will to be different. That is the unique character of the contemporary nationalism. If a collective identity is tangible, if it's concrete, it's also porous and indistinct. And by its very nature, it invites syncretism and compromise. But to the extent that it loses its concrete content, it becomes abstract the will to difference. And because it is abstract, then the object of an intransigent faith. There's nothing to compromise as the tangible content is eviscerated. There are then two possible responses to this situation. The first is the response of liberal cosmopolitanism. Suppress the will to difference. And imagine that the whole world is or should be converging to the same set of best institutions and practices. That's the idea of neutrality in another form. And it is an illusion in the service of the entrenchment of a particular order. What then should be the response of the radical Democrats to this predicament? 
their response should be to deal with the confusion of the contemporary nationalism, the will to difference. Not by trying to suppress the will to difference, but by trying to equip it. That is, to create over time the economic and political institutions that enable the different nations of the world to create difference. So the whole perspective of conventional liberal theory is that difference is the problem. And therefore, there need to be neutral principles that adjudicate among the differences. This was never the perspective of the classical liberal thinkers themselves, like John Stuart Mill or Tocqueville. Their perspective is that difference is not the problem. Difference is the task. It's the solution. The problem of these societies is that they're losing difference. And difference is what we want. Difference is the richness of humanity from which the different forms of economic and political competition can then select. The fecundity of a method of competitive selection depends always on the richness of the material from which it selects. Difference is the solution. Difference is not the problem. And so we want then an experimental market economy that is not crucified on the cross of a single version of itself that radically decentralizes access to productive opportunities and resources and allows alternative regimes of economic decentralization to coexist within itself to that end. And we want a high energy democracy that accelerates the pace of politics, elevates the temperature, and allows there to be a dialectic between the path followed by a society and counter models of the national future developed within the country as a way of a society hedging its bets and developing alternative images of its future possibilities. That's the solution. And so from this argument, their results are particular proposal. The progressives should be nationalists, but in this other sense. And uh, they should attack the, the double fiction of the tribe uh, hiding in the United States, the thesis of white supremacy, which in turn hides the, the manipulated use of the appeal of the interests of the majority, sacrifice to the interests of the privileged minorities, uh, the moneyed minorities and classes. And they should seek to equip this fertile desire for difference that exists in the world rather than to suppress it. And this alternative interpretation of the national ideal then converges with the program of a democratic experimentalism. Allow each nation to experiment. The differences that count most are not the ones that have been inherited, but the ones that will be created. Memory will inform prophecy, but the main direction will be prophetic. It will be the creation of difference over time. Yeah, I have a, um, a more profound suspicion of nationalism of any sort. Nationalism happens to be the most powerful ideology in the modern world. And it's powerful as measured by the fact that people are willing to live and die for it. More people have died in the name of various flags than any other object in the modern world. And yet there's a paradox for me because both as a radical Democrat Democracy enters the modern world in the shell of the nation state. So somehow I've got to keep track of the dignity and sanctity of everyday people raising their voices. 
and yet it was through the nation state they were able to do this primarily over against empires like the United States. There is no United States without the British Empire and the heroic struggle against British imperialism by slave holding civic republicans, George Washington and others. And he lost six battles and won three, but he won the right ones. It was heroic in the face of overwhelming imperial power. So that it looked as if it was this magnificent breakthrough, which in part it was, because I am an anti-imperialist. But at the same time, it would reinscribe and retain structures of domination that were in place under the British imperial rule from slavery and domestic households and white men not being able, without property, not being able to vote and so forth and so on. So the challenge becomes keeping track of the democratic, radical democratic possibilities of the nation state. And it's no accident in the early stages, I mean, Franz Fanon talks about this with great insight in his essay on the pitfalls of national consciousness in the wretched of the earth that there's moments in which nationalism is profoundly revolutionary. You see that Nelson Mandela was a revolutionary nationalist. But then when he takes the realm of the nation state, is he a revolutionary? No, he behaves as a neoliberal elite. He's got to deal with international capital. He's got to deal with his police now. The same police that were hunting him down, now he's got to deal with those police. You see. And he does all he can, and he's got two sides in that regard. Frederick Douglass was the same way, the exact same way. The revolutionary against a slave-holding democracy, once slavery is broken, next thing you know, he's consulate in Haiti and calling for the annexation of the Dominican Republic to become part of the American empire. You say, Fred, what's going on, brother? Well, Brother West, you got to understand the difference between being an outsider and an insider. And once you're an insider within a nation state, you've got a whole different lens to which you look at the world. What is the nation state? It is the institutional network that has a monopoly on instrumentalities of violence, one. And two, it has the institutional control of the administration of various services, including educational ones. So the kind of curriculums you write are going to be tied to generating allegiance to that nation state. I know when I was going to school in Jim Crow, uh, Sacramento, every morning we got to raise our hand, Pledge of Allegiance. All black, we look at each other, what in the world are we doing? <laughs> I refused to do it one time at eight years old because my great uncle was lynched and they wrapped the flag around his, his body and he was in a military uniform because he just got back from the war. I said, I'm not going to do it. And I refused to do it to kick him out of school for two and a half months. It brought tears to my mother's eyes. I said, I'm just following Jesus, but I mean, that was my understanding of what it was to be a freedom fighter. I'm not going to pledge allegiance to this flag in light of our grand uncle. I'm not against people pledging allegiance to it. We, remember when we brought Brother Cole in here, didn't we? He, 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 he gets down, but gets on his knee in that regard. Other people who see that flag and see their great uncle who died for the flag. I can understand it. Pledge to that flag. You love your uncle and so you got different experience than I do. But the important thing is the tremendous appeal and attractiveness at the visceral level that reshapes structures of values and structures of feeling so that you become nationalist and it cuts very, very deep. And this is true for nations all around the world, especially those in the early stages that were fighting against empires in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, and so forth and so on. But once those nation states get in place, all of them must deal with what I call the permanent government of those nation states, which are the moneyed elite. And the money elite want to continually circumscribe those politicians in the nation states, those public, those public bureaucrats in the nation state to ensure that their interests are reproduced if not expanded. This is true at the local level for mayors that have to deal with the permanent government, which is always big business. Not small business, but big business. It's true for the governors, 
We saw just recently in New York with Amazon. $3 billion to the richest man in the world. Well, we have to do it because we have to defer to those persons that could generate jobs and therefore we're concerned about public interest, but we have to give tax abatements in a moment in which the subways are collapsing, the schools are decrepit, and the jobs are more and more declining in wages vis-a-vis -a, -vis a living wage. You see? So when we talk about nationalism, we have to acknowledge just how ambiguous this category is and keep track of what it looks like concretely on the ground. Now, I would never, ever, I have very, very close friends, comrades, uh, who are progressive nationalists. But I don't, I don't call myself a nationalist at all. I'm an internationalist, first and foremost. First and foremost, you see. So that if a, a baby in, 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 in Ethiopia, or a baby in Guatemala, or a baby in Tel Aviv, or a baby in Gaza, or the West Bank, have exactly the same value for me. In that sense, I'm, of course, an internationalist also. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> but then how come you're, what, what, the, but the content of your a different meaning, A different meaning to the term nationalism. Nationalism, the, nationalism is not an assertion of superiority no. uh, or the greater value of one form of life against another. So, uh, In its dominant form it is, but you're a progressive nationalist. No, no, but wait a minute. If, if you love someone, in your, the people who are close to you, that's right. not an affirmation that the other people whom you don't love or in another family, another place, are somehow worth less. It, it's, 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 it, it's an, in, an internal engagement. And, yes, and, but every and, nationalist ideology says the people inside no, of your nation have more value in no, terms of your focus. Of your, I don't know of a nation, no. a nationalism that says the people in Lithuania ought to have the no. same value no. as the people in no, Montana. No, it's like the argument of a universal altruism. Uh -huh. So someone who is like the school philosophy that's taught as, as, as moral philosophy, yeah. there's universal principles. They're not about your direct engagement. You, you affirm the equal universal worth of everyone. But it can't be you, an abstract you, you, affirmation. Okay? Yes. It's got you, to be lived. Yes, but you live in real engagements yes, in particular true. societies. That's true, too. And you can also be, as a radical uh, Democrat, mm -hmm. engaged with a particular national experiment Absolutely. and believe in world politics. So, but so how come you can't engage without but wait calling yourself no, 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 let's... Well, the label is secondary, so long as, we, as we've defined the terms. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now in the world, we have an order of globalization, which, uh, is, uh, which is imposing on humanity Absolutely. an enforced convergence Absolutely. in a particular direction. So take, for example, the World Trade Regime organized under the WTO treaties and the multilateral trade pacts. Uh, so it requires that the participants in the trading system subscribe not just to an abstract market economy, but to a particular version of the market economy, a version that prohibits under the label subsidies all the forms of strategic coordination between governments and firms that the countries that are now rich used to become rich, but they want to deny to the latecomers. It requires that everyone accept the incorporation into the rules of world trade of the odious regime of intellectual property that was developed at the end of the 19th century and that leaves the technological innovations of greatest interest to humanity in the control of a handful of multinational businesses. So it's, its basis is this kind of institutional maximalism and in incorporating into the rules of world trade this enforced convergence. What do we want with respect to the world trade regime? We want the, the opening of the world economy with the minimum of restraint on the internal institutional experiments of different societies in the construction of their own markets and democracies. So 
Otherwise, all of the all of the enemy, all of the friends of democratic experimentalism must become enemies of an open world economy. So we want the institutional minimalism, not the institutional maximalism. Now, how are we going to create this change in the direction of the global order? It's not going to be the gift of an enlightened cosmopolitan elite to humanity. It's only going to happen if down below there are strong national projects that hit against the limits imposed by this form of globalization. And what are strong national projects? They're projects that are based on the large-scale mobilization of national resources and expressed in distinct institutional arrangements, mobilizing the, on a broad base mm -hmm. the capacities of the people. That, those are strong well, national it's, projects. It's, and it's, the, it's more than national projects. There's got to be a mobilization that is international. It's got that, to be an international we, we construct. We must construct world politics and the world order not on the basis of the weakening of the national projects, but on the basis of their strengthening. This, this diversity, this divergence, this wide experimentation, which is the richness of humanity. And that's a true world project, not the world project of the cosmopolitan elite that wants to put humanity in a straitjacket. But I'm so, talking about international but, but, from but, below yes, but it's from, from but, above. But Cornell, it's false, it's wrong. To contrast, oh, no, to, contrast, to contrast strong national projects with well, no, international When they coincide, that's a beautiful thing. When they coincide. They don't when, coincide when, spontaneously. We have to make them coincide. But we, but we make them coincide when we have an internationalist message that says that the international mobilization will reinforce of the course. democratization of nation states. That's my claim. So it's, it's a qualified claim. pluralism. That is, the, the, these are different ways of organizing society. There's no one way of organizing society. We okay. have to have the possibility of organizing society in different ways. Uh, but, but the individual, but in each of these societies, what we want is that the individual be able to turn against the regime. Absolutely. And at the limit to, to escape it, to escape it and go somewhere else. Because otherwise, the division of humanity into nation states becomes the multiplication of a series of prisons. Absolutely. Now, this what we don't want is to replace the national prisons by a global prison and, and to have an enforced convergence at the global level. Mm -hmm. And once, once we understand, once we reinterpret and redirect the national principle in that way, it is not the opposite of internationalism, it is the condition of it. A certain kind of internationalism yes. I and mean, a certain kind yes. of nationalism. But let's just one quick, before we open it up, but what's at stake for you in holding on to call yourself a progressive nationalist? Because it doesn't mean that much to me at all. What's at stake for you? Well, so uh, Marx, among others, made this mistake of uh, dramatically underemphasizing have been more right the, the, the strength, the strength of the national. Oh no, he principle. saw the strength of it, but he no. he knew that the moneyed classes would be able to, to colonize it in such a way that it would be difficult for the citizens to even think internationally at all. I think there's there 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 we have here a combination of sub of substantive problems and strategic problems. So, mm -hmm. so what, what is at the core of the substantive problem is, is the principle with which I started, with which I, I don't think you disagree. Well, no, I agree with the principle. With, which, is, which is that Absolutely. humanity can develop its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. Uh, and that uh, we, we become unified by becoming different. And we have to become different on a world scale, uh, in a form of pluralism on a world scale that is qualified rather than, than, than unqualified. And these distinct, strong national projects are not a kind of minimum common denominator in the world, as the cosmopolitan elite desires in its, in its own interest. So that's what at stake. 
What at stake is the idea that the unification of humanity and the creation of a world order is not premised on, on the basis of the suppression of these experiments oh, in wow. national difference. Mm -hmm. That's what's at stake. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we can, it's, it's, it's like the collective analog to the existence of strong differences of individual character. Mm -hmm. And this, this is a fundamental idea. Uh, and now, then there's a practical aspect to this problem. If the progressives place themselves against the national principle, they condemn themselves to political defeat. Uh, they're, they're, this is a, a fact about the world. You said it but, yourself. But, but, but you're talking about politicians now. You're no, no, I'm, I'm talking about collective action and hopes. You yourself said there is nothing stronger in modern politics than the national impulse. Now, we have to understand it. What does its strength arise from? And we, we, don't, understa we don't understand mm -hmm. this, this form that it takes in the contemporary world that I described as the form resulting from the evisceration of the concrete collective identities. It's a paradox that there's this, that as, as the real differences diminish, the desire for difference increases. And there's this impotent rage of the will to difference. We have to master this. We have to understand it sympathetically. Oh, we, no, I we, understand it sympathetically. We're going to open it up. I understand it sympathetically, but I just, the dominant forms of nationalism for me represent moral and spiritual de deficiency. That's all. It the makes ones it difficult that exist, to stay in contact with the, the ones that individuals exist. under different flags. The ones that exist. Because the dominant I, ones, everyone. Because, I don't know of a nationalism. Because on every side we see perversions. Well, just every nationalism. Yeah, so then we say, so then we agree with the liberal cosmopolitan elite. No. Let's try to suppress the will no, to national difference. No, not at all, not at all, because the liberal cos cos part of the liberal cosmopolitanism went hand in hand with the imperialism. It often, it's too often goes hand in hand yeah. with the patriarchy and the white supremacy too. So the, part of it is if I look at the world through moral and spiritual lens, I don't look at the world through politics. I don't look at the world through citizens who just have strategies and tactics. I look at the world in terms of how do you stay in contact with the dignity and sanctity of individuals wherever they are, no matter what flag they're under. And then the question becomes, how do you live your life in light of that vision, given the power of nationalism? It doesn't mean you're anti-American. It means you are concerned about the blind spots in any nation state that lose sight of that dignity. And you ways in which foreign policy, especially when you're an empire, becomes even more important. More important. That's the reason why, for example, when American is killed by a US drone, after having been denied for six or seven years in a row, they have a press conference the same day, and that family receives economic compensation that same moment. And yet you've already killed hundreds of innocent folk in, in Yemen and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Somalia, and you denied that you were killing them. Well, that's a, that, that's a sign of a nationalism. That American life means so much to us that we're going to tell the truth and then provide economic support. But that life in Yemen, collateral damage. You got a whole bureaucratic category for a human being in that way. That's just one instance of what I'm talking about. But, let, 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 but, the, pra but, wait a minute. but the yes. practical consequence yes. would be a political tragedy. The political tragedy is to allow the right to monopolize the nationalist impulse. Uh, be, there's no need for that because it's based on a series of equivocations, of confusions that we have to cut through. If, if the label nationalist has come now to be so laden and compromised, get rid of it and invent another label. No, we can't but, do that. You can't yeah, do that in but, history now. You can't do that in history. And there's going to be enough people to do exactly what you said. There's got to be some folk like myself who go over against it including my progressive uh, uh, comrades. There's got to be some voices that go over against it because nationalism is so pervasive, it's so hegemonic, I don't have to worry about various politicians and citizens being tied to nationalism. They are ubiquitous. 
you do have to worry because they're tied to perverse forms. Of no, no, I'm talking about the progressives too. Yeah. I mean, Bernie Sanders is a nationalist. The man's a patriot. He's my comrade. He's my brother. But we have differences. That's not my priority. I am first and foremost an internationalist. He understands that. He still lets me stay in the campaign. <laughs> hey, that's the kind of progressive nationalist he is. I can appreciate that, you see. So it's not a question of not having deep connections, relations, alliances with progressive nationalists, but it's also being true to one's own calling and one's own vocation. Because if the Christian, every flag is under the cross. The cross is international. That is the primary feature of one's identity for me, you see. But the premise is that there is an inverse relation between the international and the national. And it's that premise that I deny. Well, that's so abstract, it's hard to follow. No, it's not so abstract. <laughs> it's not so inverse. abstract. No, it's not, it's not so abstract. You said it. You said it. You're, what do you mean, you're, inverse you're, relation? You're, you're, you're an internationalist first, you said. That's right. Therefore, quiet down on the nationalism part. It's the opposite. No, it's the opposite. If, if you want to build a world order, you need strong national projects. I'm saying the opposite. And so that's, that's the, the term inverse is simply a reference to that opposition of, of ideas. But, 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 but yeah, we have a different, just a quick question here. Oh, oh, I think you had your hand first, and then we'll go straight to here. Go right ahead. So wait, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts on cosmopolitanism? Very suspicious of it. Louder. No, cosmopolitanism is much more practical than that. It's, it's, a, it's a doctrine of convergence. It's, there should be a world order, and it should impose on all the Come nation together, states of the world a, a cumulative convergence to the same set of supposedly best practices and institutions. And then you'll have these different elites that will be governing different states, and they'll have their local culture, their folklore, but the cultural differences will float over an increasing institutional convergence. That is an unacceptable basis on which to build internationalism. Because that means that everyone who understands the significance of diversity in the construction of humanity must become an enemy of this world order. And that is, in fact, what is happening in the world. But to just finish up, though, but you see the difference between the cosmopolitanism from the liberal elites and the internationalism from other sources. Those two discourses are very different discourses. They sound like they're the same. But finish up, though, brother. I don't. I was just curious because when you talk about nationalism, there's certain things that you say about um, empire and liberty it goes back to imperialism. It was the United States as being an empire. You have that artistic circulation stuff that's not non inspired, but it is definitely. Absolutely. I mean, part of the problem of the liberal cosmopolitan discourse is not simply that it's one that imposes from below, but it's through the lens of elites who have been in denial about America as an empire. Whereas internationalism, if you if you in parts of Latin America and Africa and, and, and somebody tells you America is not an empire, it's just a... Uh, uh, nation, a nation state with experimentation with 4,800 military units around the world. Oh, I see. We just have a foreign policy. We don't have, have imperialism. But then you got a, a wonderful moment for dialogue, right? But you can see the differences. It's very, very crucial clash. And it's the internationalist perspective that tries to accent what you're talking about. And, and that doesn't mean that, that cosmopolitan was better than tribalism. My God, you know, my dear brother, uh, uh, Anthony Appiah, he's one of the finest public intellectuals in the country, in the world. He's been pushing liberal cosmopolitanism for 30 some years. We go at it all the time because of the differences of the lens through which we, we view the international project. And yet we both still have alliances with different kinds of nationalists. He's first and foremost a cosmopolitanist. Yes. Sir. 
Of course. Of course. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. No. Those are wonderful questions. So the question addressed to me, um, uh, what we want is a qualified pluralism. As I said, not an unqualified pluralism. They're, they're, we want these different national experiments around the world to all of them be open, open to internal contradiction, open to internal rebellion and transformation, uh, and corrigible in, in, in the light of experience. We, we can't enforce that yet. We're not in a position to enforce this qualified pluralism yet. But that's what we want. Uh, so the, the, the form of global order that is being developed in the world uh, under this present system, has as another feature, in addition to what I called the institutional maximalism, that uh, things and money are increasingly free to roam the world. But people are imprisoned in the nation state or in blocks of relatively homogeneous nation states such as the European Union. And or, what, or stateless. Yes, or stateless. And what we would want. Millions of refugees. And what we would want is that instead of this stark contrast between the mobility of the inanimate and the immobility of the living, they would all gain freedom together in small cumulative steps. Labor mobility cannot be imposed universally. It would subvert all the governments in the world. But we can move in the direction of the mobility of labor. And our idea should be that the movement of things and of money in the world is sometimes useful and sometimes harmful. But the movement of people is sacrosanct because it is part of the process by which humanity becomes both unified and diverse. Now, if we think that, this, that the, the world must be organized in this form of different national experiments, we want them all to be open, contradictory, with, with, to be open to challenge and transformation and corrigible. But there must be a guarantee at the end of the day. And the guarantee is that the individual must be able to escape the world into which he was born and to go into another world. That's the, that's the ultimate guarantee. Because you, you're, you're, you're born into a, one of these forms of life. And it turns out you, you attempt to transform it, to challenge it, to turn it into something else. And you fail. Are you then condemned to be always there? You must, you must be able to be free, to leave, and to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's part of this vision. And, that's, that's, uh, and this is where we have a fundamental overlap. I mean, I use more explicit Christian language in terms of commitment to dignity, sanctity, and potentiality of each person. Each person having this kind of specialness, no matter what it is, who, who they are, national identity, gender, sexual orientation, whatever it is, skin pigmentation, and so forth. But at the same time, the question becomes, well, what, was that, what does that look like on a global scale? given the historic realities in which we find ourselves, then you get tied to Socratic and democratic energy. The best we finite creatures can do is to ensure that people raise their voices, not in echo chambers, but distinctive voices, like the fingerprint, only their voice, tied to their conception of what it is to make and remake themselves. 
But there's so that, and this is where it takes back to the U.S. Constitution, the brother. The part of the genius of the Constitution was there were incipient democratic possibilities in the separations of power and the commitment to revision of Constitution, so that new voices could be heard, power and pressure could be brought to bear, so you can actually get a democratization over time if your people are willing to courageously fight for it. But when they're captured, when they're truncated, when they're marginalized, when they're discriminated against, and so forth and so on, you can get to shrinking. And we're living in a moment of deep right-wing populist shrinking. And you say, how could the populist shrink? Oh, no, people have been consenting to their oppression for a long time. There's powerful ideological apparatuses in place to convince people to consent to their own domination and oppression. But, but there, there is the following fundamental contrast of attitude. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has not come up yet in our discussion. Uh, so the, the dominant attitude of the conventional nationalism is that the national distinction, the difference, is something that's already there. It's inherited. It's, it's like a, a, the patrimony, like an exhibit in a museum. It's a fossil, and you have to preserve it. And I claimed, in my characterization of the contemporary nationalism, that the truth is that these differences are always vanishing. They're always shrinking. Uh, and so uh, what matters is not the difference that you've inherited but the difference that you can create. What you will create will, of course, be informed by this but inheritance, by this memory. But the whole emphasis is on the, on the making of difference in the future. And this idea that, that are of transcendence, on which you also disagree philosophically, uh, right, that right. the roots of a human being lie in the future. Uh, that changes everything. Uh, and and, it, and it, it's an example of what you could call the law of the spirit. The, the, the law of the spirit is that you can preserve only what you renounce. So you have to renounce something in order to be able to reinvent it. And it's by reinventing it that you breathe new life and meaning into it. And then you preserve it. And that's, that's the significance, which is the opposite of the of the, of the dangerous fiction that there's this crystallized difference that's already there that you have to protect against its enemies. And so I think if we, if we understand the centrality of that attitude, we begin to think of the relation between the national and the international in a different way. In a different way. Well, no matter how novel anything is, it's never wholly novel. Yes. There's always an element of the past shot yeah. through it. Question. Uh, uh, apologies for the temporary nature of this comment. Um, so what is, what, I would ask, what is your spatial projection of this position in terms of the territory of the land? Because for, because they're under specific to your argument of this sort of uh, self-actualization through an economic model of uh, individualism or self-employment, I feel like uh, the observation that we are decoupled from the land as an agrarian society is well reflected in the comment you had made about this uh, uh, transient international elites that have no specific ter territorial allegiance or territorial anchoring of that wealth or capital in a, in a specific community or society. And we see this reflection in uh, the commodification of land in our cities as a, uh, as a means of... Yeah. But you know, this is another source of confusion. Yeah. Because today, in our world, the nation state remains the main theater of, of action and transformation. The global order would change only by the change being forced from below in the nation states. But I don't think that the nation state will be the main theater of action forever. There will be subnational or supranational theaters. So it's not some kind of reification of the nation state as the permanent vehicle of humanity. The, so the, the argument is an argument about diversity. It's not an argument about the sanctity or the permanence of these particular vehicles of the diversity. They're contingent. Uh, 
but they're what exists now. And, and, it's, and if, if we want to unify humanity, we should unify it paradoxically on the basis of the strengthening rather than of the suppression of the diversity. That's the central idea. But we should not confuse the ideal of the diversification of humanity with the particular contingent vehicles, which are now these nation states. Uh, they're not eternal. And if we were to treat them as permanent and sacrosanct, we would turn them into another set of idols, which goes together with this reverential attitude that I just condemned, that the, that the main differences are the inherited differences rather than the differences to be created. We're out of time. Our time is over. Already? Yeah. <laughs> Not because the nation state said so, no. but because we have a schedule that we have to stay on. Because this will be continued next week and the week after and the week after. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> that was rich stuff. Right? What do you think? That was rich, man. Uh -huh. Lord have mercy. I like that, man. I like that. But brother, I'm going to be praying for you, though, man. Go ahead, absolutely. Absolutely.